Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, MD, graduated from Brown University, Phi Beta Kappa, magna, magna Cum Laude, then worked as a journalist, first at Time, Inc., before pursuing pre-medical studies at Columbia. He subsequently received his medical degree from Cornell University Medical College in 1983. During a postgraduate immunology fellowship under Dr. Robert A. Good, considered the fa father of modern immunology, he completed a research study evaluating nutritional therapy in the treatment of advanced cancer. Since 1987, Dr. Gonzalez has been in private practice. His nutritional research has received substantial financial support from Procter & Gamble, Nestle, and the National Cancer Institute. Results from a pilot study published, published in 1999 describe the most positive data in the medical literature for pancreatic cancer. Dr. Gonzalez recently published his first two books, The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer, and his second book, One Man Alone. His third book is The Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, which is a reprint of John Baird's book. These books will be on sale tomorrow at booth number 68. Thank you. Okay, microphone working, sound okay? If it gets too low, just put your hand up. I understand sometimes I fade away a bit, so just let me know if that's happening. They're going to have it a little bit louder. I'm going to finish up with about maybe seven and a half minutes on Dr. Beer, and then we'll move on to talk more about nutrition. Um, I left the previous session in 1902 with Beard's paper announcing the trophoblastic theory of cancer. Didn't get too much publicity. In 1905, January 1905, in a lecture in Liverpool, England, he gave a lengthy lecture, and that was about six months before there was talk of him winning the Nobel Prize. A lot of press were in attendance. In that lecture, he announced the trophoblastic theory of cancer, this idea that cancer doesn't develop from the mature differentiated tissues, but from these vagrant germ cells that lay scattered throughout all the tissues, that these cells can start dividing, produce either the teratoma, which we talked about, or in men and women, the egg, the primitive oogonia, which through parthenogenesis then undergoes its normal biologic destiny, which is to produce the trophoblast, the only invasive tissue known. He discussed his thesis that in the billfish, the pancreatic enzymes in the embryo control its growth, Therefore, in the trophoblast, it seemed logical that the pancreatic enzymes of the embryo would cause control its growth. Indeed, he found that to be the case. And then he announced that pancreatic enzymes, since cancer is trophoblastic in its origins, not only in its nature, but in its very origins, and since trophoblast is controlled by pancreatic proteolytic enzymes, the protein digesting component, pancreatic enzymes of the body's main defense against cancer would be useful as a cancer treatment. Now, that lecture unlike his 1902 paper, received enormous publicity. It was in all the major newspapers, front page stories in the U.S. as well as abroad in England. Uh, because Beard was already getting some reputation as not only kind of this eccentric crank, but also as a very brilliant, uh, you know, primary scientist. He was a great lab technician, as we said early, great lab scientist in the best of traditional senses. And the world announced that there might be a solution to cancer. But of course, at that point, it was still largely theoretical. But Beard, being an extraordinarily qualified scientist and a good in laboratory investigator, decided to test it both in laboratory and human models. Remember, this is 1905-1906. There really weren't a whole lot of treatments for cancer at that time. And although we think of 100 years ago in our mind, it might seem like a primitive time, they did have sophisticated tumor models for cancer biology. One of them was the Jensen's mouse tumor, which is a type of sarcoma. So Beer decided to test his enzymes in that model. Now, pancreatic enzymes were available in the pharmaceutical industry at that point. They had, trypsin had been identified in 1858 by Kuhn. In the 1880s, some enterprising scientists had learned that the pancreatic proteolytic enzyme trypsin was a good treatment for diphtheria. At that time, diphtheria was an endemic disease, very prevalent both in Europe and the U.S., and it was deadly. There were no antibiotics. There was no treatment for it. There was no vaccine. And it was really quite scary because the bacillus the diphtheria bacillus would produce a membrane in the larynx that would actually cause suffocation. It was not a pleasant way to die. Scientists had discovered in a laboratory model of diphtheria in the 1880s that trypsin applied as a powder directly on the membrane would dissolve it and the mice would live. Tried it in some humans, it worked. By 1900, 1905, there were injectable formulations of pancreatic enzymes available. At that point, it was thought that if you took them orally, they would be destroyed by hydrochloric acid in the stomach as proteins, so they had to be injected. Merck, which existed at that time, and Fairchild, major pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. and abroad, 
both had very good preparations of pancreatic enzymes, so they were available. And Beard used the Fairchild preparation in this uh, Jensen's mouse tumor, and it was a very simple experiment. He had six animals that had this transplanted tumor, were untreated, they were the control. He had two animals that had the tumor that normally killed very quickly, within days, weeks, and in the two animals he injected the pancreatic enzymes and the tumors died and fell off. The six animals, untreated, all died as per usual schedule. He went from the laboratory into clinical studies. The first case I have been able to find in the literature from that time was Clarence Rice, who was actually an American on Madison Avenue, New York, maybe half a dozen blocks from my own office today, interestingly enough. And Clarence Rice worked with Beard, although he was in, England, he, he was in Edinburgh at that time, and he was in Madison Avenue, New York. The first patient they tried it on, the first patient I know of, of, of appropriately diagnosed cancer, who underwent enzyme therapy. And again, although we think of as that time as kind of primitive, they knew how to diagnose cancer. They knew how it looked under the microscope. Cancer pathology, as I've said, was very highly developed. This patient had been biopsy proven. Um, they used the injectable enzymes. The tumor died, fell off, the patient lived. Between 1907 and 1909, there were a series of patients in the conventional medical literature, the Journal of the American Medical Association, British Medical Journal, Journal of the American Medical Association, all the main journals, and I have copies of these articles, showing that the injectable pancreatic enzymes would cause tumors to slough off. Now, in Beard's 1911 book, which we'll talk about, he has photographs of a, of a man with a tumor in the cheek that under enzyme therapy fell off and the cheek completely healed. So this was quite remarkable, but Beard was almost a victim of his own success. There was so much enthusiasm from the en for the enzyme therapy, predictably, unscrupulous drug manufacturers began producing their own enzymes without consulting with Beard, and there were all kinds of products, all kinds of formulations derived from all kinds of animals. Pancreatic enzymes then and today are derived from commercially, uh, commercially obtained pancreases from animals used for the butcher trade, from meat industry, from pigs, sheep, cattle. But Beard said that, you know, pancreatic enzymes are very unstable. They're, they're prote the proteolytic enzymes dissolve proteins, but pancreatic enzymes themselves are proteins. And if they're not handled properly, they can, the mixture can start auto-digesting and you end up with an ina inactive preparation of amino acids. Well, a lot of these unscrupulous drug companies began marketing enzymes to treat cancer that had no confirmation of their efficacy, their potency. Uh, physicians without consulting with Beard would start using them. They didn't follow his dosing schedule. Beard was a meticulous scientist, as I imagine you realize by now, and he had laid out very specific dosing schedules, which formulations to use. A lot of the physicians didn't use it, so failures began to appear in the literature, and Beard was really upset about this. This man had a short fuse, and he wrote letters to the editor blasting scientists and physicians that were using inappropriate doses, inappropriate formulations to treat cancer, saying if you don't use the right dose in the right form, of course you're going to have failure. But there was another problem. During that period, Madame Curie, much beloved, our first great science media star, announced to the world that radiation was a simple, easy, non-toxic cure for all cancer. She'd won two Nobel Prizes. Her story was very dramatic. She was this poor Polish immigrant, one of the first PhD students at the University of Paris with her husband, both of them PhD students. They lived in a shack on the outskirts of Paris because they had no money. Both of them earned PhDs. 1895, x-rays were discovered, and very quickly it was learned they could be useful diagnostically. You could see the inner, inner organs for the first time. But also, in experimental models, they could make tumors shrink. Well, that was very misleading because, yes, they make tumors shrink, but in human cancer, they may shrink, but they usually come back more aggressively. Most cancers ultimately don't respond to radiation. And it is not non-toxic, but as we were to learn, very toxic, and a whole generation of radiation students and scientists were to die of the effects of radiation exposure, including Madame Curie, who died from aplastic anemia. In fact, her laboratory records and notebooks are so radioactive, even today, if you want to study them at the University of Paris, they're in special rooms. You have to put on protective garb. But Madame Curie was, again, a, a science star. She knew how to use the press. And when she announced around 1907, 1908, in that period, that radiation was a simple, easy, non-toxic cure for all cancer, Peer, people forgot Beard, who had this complicated thesis about alternations of generations, migrations of germ cells, trophoblastis cancer. Radiation is a heck of a lot simpler. And it's, you know, Madame Curie has two Nobel Prizes. Beard lost his Nobel Prize in 2006 because of the controversy, in, in 1906, because of the controversy surrounding his cancer work. When, when he died in, in 1924, he died in obscurity. In 1911, he did publish a book, which I have a, our facsimile reprint now, called The Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, that should have changed the course of medicine. Unfortunately, it did not, for the simple reason it was so far ahead of its time 
No one knew what he was talking about. Now we, everyone in this room knows what a stem cell is.